All right, let's get down to the meat and potatoes of the conference, and that is um, our first big guest. Um, and we're really happy today because he has um, offered to come and sit down with me and for a half hour basically talk about what's going on in this um, exciting and maybe even a little crazy IT world that we're living in right now. And I'd like for you to give a big round of applause to the CEO of SAP, Mr. Bill McDermott. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you here. Take a seat right here. Seat right there. It's good to see you. We were going to try to catch up backstage, but things were a little crazy, so we didn't get to. Um, welcome. You're our first guest this week. All right. How did we? How did we get that? Land that? I I tell you, you know, you just good sales. We do, we do good sales. Um, what is happening right now? in the IT world, everyone is, is saying the word disruptive. Mm -hmm. Is that something that SAP is, is that something everyone's talking about as well? We're leaning in to disruption with new innovation. Uh, I think the big uh, three things I would feature that we're driving as a company is one, help companies run real time. Yeah. And this is SAP HANA and the HANA platform. Why do I think that's impactful? Because you can shrink the IT stack 10x, yeah. the throughput that goes through it increase 7x, and it's 2,000 times faster than any other technology in the world. So that's run real time. The second is run networked. Every company in here is global and they're digitizing, but the big issue is how do they conduct commerce between companies, mm -hmm. whether it's labor, the fastest growing labor force in the world is temporary labor, whether it's direct or indirect materials, huge opportunity to leverage the global economy and your trading partners. And then, of course, there's travel and expense, whether it's ground, air, hotel, food and entertainment. Mm -hmm. How do I leverage what I do in an efficient global network? And then finally, there's run simple. Mm -hmm. you know, how do I make my company simple? Uh, the fact of the matter is up to 10% of operating profits are forfeited on pure complexity. So we introduced a new innovation to the market, S4 HANA, yep, which right. is our fourth generation business suite natively built on HANA to completely change the way companies run. One database, fully integrated business processes in all the industries of the world. All right, for, for the audience a little bit, um, explain to us what HANA is because um, we are assuming we've got people watching live stream sure. as well. Um, they may not be in the IT industry, so give us a little background. HANA is the world's leading in-memory database platform. So as you think about running companies today, you have to know what's going on in real time. This requires you to understand all the transactions that are happening in your company. What are the sales like in Beijing versus New York versus London? There's a lot of unstructured information in enterprises today, such as text, such as social information, things that are being fed through mobile platforms and partners. All this is data. And data is doubling in the world every 12 months. So you have to have a handle on what's going on in real time in your business. HANA is the world's leading in-memory database platform that helps companies completely rethink how they run their business in real time. Okay. That's big um, for you. Another thing is the mic working, gentlemen. Have we got the, the mic working, gentlemen? Do we have the mic working? I think we've got a mic problem. Can you guys hear me? There you no? go, Brent. You Just got a handheld coming. All right, how's this? Does this work? Much better. All right, good. Um, let, let's talk a little bit uh, about the notion of the business network. Yes. Um, I, I know that's, that's a big and an important key word for you. So right. what's the story behind that? So the story is this. You know, one of the things that companies have to do in this global economy is collaborate with their partners and, of course, their trading partners around the world. And companies that are in this audience and around the world need to also deal with the most important asset of all, which is people. How do I recruit the very best people to focus on a project? How do I make sure they're secure? How do I manage the cost associated with those people in real time, just the way I manage my full-time equivalent workforce? 
There's a business network that does that efficiently now. It's called Field Glass. It's SAP Field Glass. And please keep in mind, Brent, as I said earlier, the fastest growing workforce in the world is temporary labor. It's growing at 40% in Europe and the United States as an example. The second thing is direct and indirect materials. The things that you buy, whether it's to help you build your products or simply support your business. The partners and the way to buy may come from all different parts of the world and you obviously want to buy smart. So as we all know, competition destroys profits. There's 1.7 million trading partners that are now dealing with competing for your business in direct and indirect materials. Typically, a customer can save 15, 20% sometimes on the indirect and the direct material cost associated with their business. And then I mentioned the other part of the business network, and that's, by the way, Ariba, direct and indirect materials. And then I mentioned travel and expense. Well, Concur was an important acquisition for SAP because you came here, you took ground, you took air, you're going to eat some things, you're going to entertain a little bit, you're going to stay in hotels. How do we create an efficient network where you get the best value for your money and at the same time a smart guy like you that has other things to do with his time doesn't have to um, waste time on filling out expense reports. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, <laughs> um, every time you know you take a business trip and you get a receipt, um, why do I have to deal with the receipt? Why can't the hotel, for example, put that, uh, you know, take care of that for me? It can. In fact, today, the way typically most business travelers travel, you're going to order ground transportation. Sometimes that's a well-known brand. Other times it could be Uber or some other digitally enabled service. You're also going to acquire a hotel. Uh, typically you want to do that at the rate your CFO when your company approves, but yet we're in an internet economy and you want the best value for your money. So as long as you stay within the threshold to spend, you want to get the best possible room you can. When you're ordering a cup of coffee or you're eating out, you want to make sure you stay within the spend threshold, but you want the best value for your money and ultimately, you have no interest any longer in time-consuming, painful expense reports. Right, right. So now it's all of this time. is automated. All of those receipts are completely digitized mm -hmm. and they're automatically uploaded into the ERP system so the business traveler can have a great trip, but the people running your company can sleep tight at night knowing it's all been updated, it's compliant, it's transparent, and it's in the ERP system. Um, these are, these are all great um, ideas that you're talking about, um, but we can't get beyond the fact that SAP, like a lot of companies, is, is dealing with a lot of disruption right now. I, I know for, for your company, you're transitioning from a, uh, a pay up front company to a pay as you go. Um, is, I, I know that you, you've been quoted as saying that's just a bump in the road, but uh, I mean, people who are in the know will say that's more than just a bump in the road, isn't it? Well, I think business model innovation and the idea of giving the customer what the customer wants is what winning companies have to do. So in 2010, SAP had very little going on in the cloud. In fact, we had about 10 million US dollars in business. Today, we have more cloud business users than any other company in the information technology industry, more than 70 million. And yes, of course, if the customer wishes to rent the software instead of buy the software, they should also have that option, and they do. And when I say it's a bump in the road, I simply mean that the net present value on a rental contract will pay the vendor, in this case SAP, more money over time than a sale contract. So the bump in the road is you have to wait basically around three years before a rental is actually more valuable than a sale. So explaining this to the capital markets is a bump in the road, but it's also something that people really understand when they look at the future revenues and the future growth of our company. And do you think shareholders understand that? Absolutely. I think that right now, cloud has become the pervasive computing theme of this generation. I think the bigger issue would be, what if a company didn't change? What if a company didn't have bold moves on the horizon, and what if the company wasn't going where the customer wanted them to go? I think that should create all kinds of shareholder reaction. In our case, 
We knew data was doubling in the world every 18 months, so we invented HANA. We knew that everything was mobile, and it had to be a gorgeous consumer-grade user experience, so we invented Fiori and rewrote the user experience of SAP. We knew many companies would want to run in the cloud, whether it was for a line of business applications such as HR or sales or procurement. But now companies, and many companies, want to run the whole corporation in the cloud. And then there's the idea of how do I not only deal with my company, but how do I conduct commerce between my company and other companies in the business network? Today, with S4 HANA and the assets SAP has, you can do all of that in a fully integrated, secure way, and you can run your company on a mobile device. We, um, we're excited about you being our, our first guest today um, because we could maybe use you a little bit as a guinea pig. I'm happy to be one. Um, and <laughs> maybe throw some of the issues at you that we're going to be talking about sure. this week. Um, you, know, you, <clears throat> you talked about in the future, um, more and more people are going to be working part-time or um, are going to be temp workers. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about the fact that we are going to reach a point where the economy can no longer provide jobs for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, there will be a time when, because for example, things being done in the cloud, um, the, the whole notion of an IT department will become obsolete mm -hmm. um, one day. Um, what, how do you foresee society, I'm gonna ask you to think about the big picture here, um, what's gonna happen in 20, 30 years um, when companies like SAP continue to advance and make more and more people basically able to live without a job. Mm -hmm. where, where do you see society? I'm just, we're asking, you know, we want to ask you maybe to kind of look into the crystal ball and talk about where you see the world and where it's headed. Well, I, I always think um, very optimistically about jobs and dreams. So for one thing, you're always going to need people because people need to deal with people. And the ultimate form of trust and the ultimate human currency goes hand in hand with one person believing and doing business with another person. There is no doubt that the digital march is on. And there is also no doubt that people will have to be retooled and reskilled to keep pace with the digital economy. In our own company, we have to restructure the workforce to get people focused on where the world is going and where the customer needs us to be as opposed to where they are. We are, however, I think a very good example of a growth company that in the aggregate increases jobs even as we change where those jobs are. So for example, the business network is a huge hockey stick in job creation. The cloud is a huge hockey stick in job creation. The HANA business that has now become the leading in-memory cloud platform in the world is a huge hockey stick there may at the same time be other things that could be done in an automated way where you can go direct to consumer, where you used to have a heavy business model in the past and you don't need that anymore. So I don't think in the aggregate we're going to lose the opportunity to create jobs. I do think, do think they'll be in different places. Will we be able to create enough jobs though? What do you think? I really do. I believe so strongly. I'll give you another example. Okay. I'm on the board of a, a sports apparel business that's Under Armour. well known, Under Armour. Yeah, let, let me ask if people are aware of that. Raise your hand. People, are, do you know what Under Armour is? How many people in the audience? Okay, so a good percentage, okay. Probably if he asked that question five years ago. Zero. Uh, zero, maybe 10% of the hands today, almost every single person knows. But Under Armour is creating lots and lots of jobs. What is their primary focus? And this is part of what SAP is doing to transform our company as well. Brent, there once was a time where Salesforce automation, let me understand my pipeline and my forecast and make the sales director happy. That was a form of really innovative stuff. Today, that is pure commodity. I've got it, other people have it, sort of everyone has it now, right? But what isn't commodity? What isn't commodity is Under Armour makes shirts and shoes. But in the end, they know that they have to relate to that consumer in any channel, direct to consumer, call center, wholesaler, retailer, on any device. So whatever device that consumer is using, that is their device of choice. And when a company interfaces with that device and that consumer, 
they need to know who they are, who they are socially, what their likes and preferences are, how they can predict an offer, simulate an offer, perhaps even make a real-time offer and close a digital transaction. Add one more interesting fact around this internet-based economy, or the de-economy, as it's being called here at CBIT, is community. So Under Armour, as an example, just acquired three companies. Why? Because their athletes are participating in communities. They want to have a digital, wearable device connected to the mobile, connected to the community, so within the community they compete in, they can absolutely look at not only their own personal stats, but they can gamify it and look at how they're performing against other athletes of similar backgrounds and so forth. So now I have this digital vision. I still have to drive my core business, but I know that it just changed and it became a digital world, one that's 360 degrees, and I have to know that consumer, care for that consumer, and do more for that consumer than anybody in my space. I mean, I, I, I notice immediately, um, I can relate to this too, this we can, yes we can yes. spirit that, you, that, that yes. you bring from the United States. Um, and you talk about the company needs to know the consumer as yes. much as possible. We are in Germany and uh, Germ Germans are known for being um, adamant about data protection, yes. data security. Is there a limit? Should there be a limit? Can there be a limit to how much you know about your customers? The most important part of this answer is we have to always protect the privacy of the individual, protect that data, and always be in full compliance with every local and international law that exists today. And it, I whose job is that, though? I mean, I, I want to pick your brain. Do, is it, is it the, the state's responsibility to protect the consumer, or should the state tell businesses, for example, that you have a responsibility to protect your consumer? Well, I think the business has a responsibility technically to make sure any innovation they bring to the market absolutely is a secure solution with no back doors and no ability to access remotely through a back door to protect the data and the privacy of the individual. That is absolutely the responsibility of the company in the technology industry. We've been at this for four and a half decades. It's the thing we take most seriously. Having said that, it's also very important that we have a free global economy where you can make innovation and give each of the industries, whether they're in the public or the private sector, the choice to utilize that technology, as long as that technology is in full compliance with local and international standards and laws, and it's fully transparent and compliant. But those industries have to have a right to utilize that innovation and serve their, their missions, their goals. And I think it's a slippery slope when business decides for industry what they should or shouldn't do with the technology. I don't think that's our purpose in life. Have you noticed a difference coming from the United States moving, moving to Germany? Have, have you been able to, to feel, to sense the, the difference in, in awareness uh, about data protection, or, or do you think that it's a lot of hype, more hype than... <laughs> it's not hype, and of course, I have been able to sense it. You know, I've been with SAP now 13 years, so I've been a part of the movement, and there's no doubt that the idea of privacy and data protection and security is at a heightened pitch right now. It is greater in Germany and Europe than other parts of the world that I've been in, but it's clearly an issue everywhere. One of the things we're determined to do as a company is give our customers choice. So unlike some companies in our industry that only have one choice, you know, the cloud is in Northern California and you're gonna like it whether you like it or not. Uh, we believe that the customer should be able to run our technology in their own data center, in our data center, or a partner's data center, and have that same ultimate feeling about security that they would in any environment. And we do not dictate where the customer has to run 
our technology. We think the customer should have choice. Has the, has the NSA scandal, we know that there have been American companies that have really taken a hit in, in, in contracts, for example, of people not wanting to do business with American companies. SAP, has SAP benefited from that? Whether we have benefited or not, I, I really would find a difficult time putting a metric on it. But I can tell you, uh, at least spiritually, yeah. when I speak to customers, even our partners, they're very happy that they have choice. They know that we believe in the free flow of data. They know that we believe in the openness of a digital global economy. But they also know that we've gone to great lengths to innovate without disrupting their business. And by giving them choice to run our technology in their own data center, in, their, uh, in our data center, or in a partner's data center that might be a neutral site, and knowing that it has those same strict security standards, and there are no back doors, and you can't access through a back door, and we rigorously survey and have the tools built into our technology to protect the security and the data privacy of the individual has clearly been an advantage for us. Whether that's resulted in more sales or not, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see in the future. You know, you know, Steve Wozniak, when he was sitting up here last year, I, I asked him if, um, if there are any back doors built any, into any software that comes from Apple. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, um, I don't really know. Um, no one knows. Um, what about if someone asks you at SAP, can you guarantee your customer that there are no back doors in anything that they will be using connected with SAP? There are no back doors in SAP technology, period. Okay. I mean, that's, period. A, that's, that's a firm word. That's the first time we've had someone on stage actually period. commit to that. Um, that's how we like to start the week, right? <laughs> You've got people here. Are you people laughing because you agree with them? Good. That's, that's a good way to start with the week. Let's talk about your book for a second. I mean, we don't want to let you go without um, talking about this latest that's book. That's your copy. Oh, that's my copy. I actually oh, autographed you. it for and everything. Winner's Dream. Um, if you haven't seen the book, um, you should get a copy. It's a great book. Um, I, I'm actually in the process right now of reading it. You know, I wanted to prep for today. <laughs> a journey from the corner store to the corner office. Uh, before we let you go, talk to us about this idea, and, and people say it's, kind of, it's a very American idea, of coming from very little and becoming something very big. Is that, is that a, a story that is translatable now in this globalized economy to everybody? Yeah, I think it is, because if you looked at, the reason I went for corner store to corner office, by the way, yeah. is um, when I was uh, a teenager, I, tra I traded in three part-time jobs for my own delicatessen business, which I bought on a small loan because I didn't have any money. How old were you when you bought this deli? 17. 17. So you bought a deli at 17. Well, that in itself is, I mean, I don't know about what most of you were doing when you were 17. I was not buying a deli when well, I was 17. I, I, well, I, I have to tell you, it was, uh, it was a great opportunity, and I probably got a little bit lucky, but hard work sometimes can make you lucky. Yeah, sure. but, I, I, but I think what was interesting about that experience is I essentially learned everything I needed to know about being a CEO. That's why I think corner store to corner office is appropriate. What did I learn? Basically, we had three kinds of customers that I had to serve. Senior citizens, I learned that they would prefer to have things delivered than come out of their houses, so I delivered. Okay. I looked at the blue collar worker like my dad with jeans and a t-shirt, they weren't wearing suits and ties and they were rich on Friday night, and they were broke by Sunday morning. So I gave them credit. Yeah. And then there were the high school kids that I had to get to walk a block past my number one competitor to my store. So one day I go down there, they're lined up 40 at a time outside the store, only four in the store. And I say to one of the kids, why is everybody out here when there's so much room in there to buy things in the store? Kid says, well, they think we're going to take things. I said, well, don't worry about all that. You come on down to my store. And I got some video game rooms, and that was kind of the honey that drew the bees. And we treated them like adults, and we let them in 45 at a time. And the underscore. Did they steal anything? Well, actually, no. no. And one of the kids said to me one day, Bill, when we want to have great food, be treated with respect, and play video games, we come here. 
And when we want to steal stuff, we go to the store down there. So, <laughs> very you know, you, you treat your, your customer right, and, and that's the same lesson at SAP. If you understand going in that in the end it's the customer and the customer alone that will determine whether you win or lose, whether you're a 17 year old entrepreneur or you're running a big company, you actually can't go wrong. But I tell you, if you ever lose sight of that, you're not a winner. You are an American. You moved to Germany yes. with SAP. And I under, if I understand this correctly, you moved to Germany the week that Germany was winning the World Cup. Yeah. Is that correct? Now, how many people live in Germany in the audience? How many do we have? OK. Now, you know when Germany's winning the World Cup, it is not your typical Germany, right? right? So kind of tell the audience, wh what did you experience? It was amazing, Brent, because I, I came in on a, a Tuesday night that turned into a Wednesday morning, and it was probably around 1 a.m. that I was watching on CNN, I think it was, the, the fact that Germany had beat Brazil 7-1, to which was like an amazing match. Right, right. That same week, I had the supervisory board over to my home to break bread. And then on that Friday, we actually had 30,000 of our closest friends, our employees, and their children at an SAP picnic. Yes. And by Sunday, SAP won the World Cup. And I was on my back porch in Heidelberg, hitting pots and pans with spoons, just like everybody else. And I thought to myself, when something's meant to be, it just happens the right way. You could have never written that script. True. And I really believe that it was a symbol of great things to come for the matchup between Bill McDermott, of course, the great country of Germany, and SAP. Yeah. I mean, do you feel at home here? I love it here. Yeah. And I always have. You know, 13 years ago, I started at SAP, and it was a very different company. You know, we were business software and analytics back then. We were a leader in our field. But we came a long way. I mean, we're, we're in businesses today. 80% of our sales come from businesses we weren't in five years ago. So this company has remained ever dynamic. But one of the things I love about our company, one of the things, is that if you think about our boardroom and the democracy of a boardroom that has employees that are actually on the board and the openness of talking about issues that actually matter to people, especially in times of transition and change, is really powerful. And again, I think the, uh, the ultimate human currency is trust. And I really felt that I've had an opportunity to define my own brand on my own terms in Germany with people I've worked with for 13 years. But I showed them, you know, day one when I became sole CEO, that I was coming to Heidelberg because I wanted the symbol of trust and unity to define you know, my role as the, the CEO in the company. And, and before we let you go, final question. And, and has that been easy to do? I mean, you're coming here in the, the Edward Snowden era now. There's a lot of mistrust out there. Um, did that affect you being able to connect with the people here? The one thing I've learned in, in just in life and business in general is people treat you and take you on the terms that you deserve to be treated and taken on. And basically, by constantly being in front of the people, recognizing the importance that anything in life worth communicating is almost always under-communicated, has served me pretty well. Because whether it's a company picnic, or a holiday party, or every quarter doing town hall meetings with our, our team, or just walking the halls in good faith, I'm proud to be SAP CEO, and I think people see that, and they trust that, and that's why I'm here. So I happen to be born in the United States of America, something I'm proud of, but I also happen to recognize my role as the CEO of SAP, and I'm very proud of our heritage as a German company, and I think there are unique characteristics and distinctions that go along with that, and also to American executives. I would also say it's really humbling to take on a career and move your family yeah, sure. and do different things right. and assimilate into different cultures, yeah. different types of boardrooms. And I think in the end, it made me better. 
and hopefully in some way I've made other people better. As a man who used to own a deli and now <laughs> living in Germany, who has the better bread, Americans or Germans? Well, I tell you, I think it depends on where you go. They're both pretty good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Give Bill a round of applause, everybody. Bill, Thank Manchester. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice to be with you.